Whether you use a prescription like Rifaximin or the herbal stuff, the question still remains. How many rounds of antimicrobials does it really take to eradicate SIBO? How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Well, in today's video, I'm going to answer one of those questions, and I'll tell you, I've never been a fan of lollipops. All right, all joking aside, I'm going to answer this question in two different ways. First, I'm going to give you the answer that's applicable to everybody, no matter what type of SIBO you have, no matter how long you've had it, what you've done, what you've tried. And then we're going to have a separate discussion based on the types of SIBO. Because yes, my answer to this question kind of depends on the type of SIBO you have, and that's going to be part two of the discussion. So first things first, let's talk about the thing that's applicable to everybody. So if you are finding yourself in a position like a lot of my students and a lot of my patients, where you have needed eight or 10 or heaven forbid more rounds of a prescription like Rifaximin, or you've been on herbal antimicrobials for years and years and years, I have seen these situations so many times. Let me tell you, my friend, both of those are enormous, enormous red flags. They're huge, right? Clearly what you're doing is not working. What is the Einstein saying, right? Or the quote that's attributed to him at least? Doing the same thing, expecting different results is the definition of insanity. This is a great version of insanity. If you have tried to kill or eradicate the SIBO numerous times and it keeps coming back, that means there's something that you're missing, probably something big. And there's something about your body and your ecosystem that is allowing the SIBO to come back. And here's, here's kind of a conceptual way to think about this. I wore this t-shirt on purpose today. Out of all of my goofy t-shirts that I love so much, I picked my Sailor Moon t-shirt for you because, and bear with me, even if you haven't seen the show, I think you're going to get what I mean by this. I think you need to level up. So here's what I mean by this. In the beginning of Sailor Moon, she gets her very first attack. She takes off her tiara, it turns into kind of like a frisbee, and she throws it at the enemy. And that's good enough to, to kill the enemies in the very first season of the show. But as she goes forward, the enemies get stronger and bigger. So, not surprisingly, as she goes through the different seasons of the show, she gets new attack items. She gets new level ups and power ups and the brooch that holds all of her power. She gets a new brooch. She gets a new wand. She gets all these new things and she becomes stronger and she evolves. Even on this t-shirt, this is her second power up out of three. So she has her Sailor Moon form. This is Super Sailor Moon. And then she has one more called Eternal Sailor Moon. And she's leveling up to meet the demands of these new bad guys and these new, these new circumstances. If she tried to use Moon Tiara action on her ultimate bad guy at the end of the TV show, it wouldn't work. It, absolutely would not work. She would get killed immediately and that would be the end of the show. So it's a really good thing for Sailor Moon that she has leveled up her game each step of the way. When she got to a point where Moon Tiara action was no longer working, she struggled with that a bit until she got her new power up and then she was able to use that. So similarly here, you are in a position where you're using Moon Tiara action and you're trying to kill the big bad guy like Queen Nehelania. At, towards the end of the show, or like Sailor, or like Chaos, right? You're trying to kill the big, big bad guy using the same tool that you got in the first episode of the show. It's just not going to work, man. At some point, you've got to get the hint. If you are knee deep into six rounds of Rifaximin or four months of herbals or whatever it might be, you've got to get the hint that it's not working. So you need to pivot and look at other things that you maybe previously have ignored, right? Everybody wants to laser in on the SIBO and focus on the killing and the starving of the SIBO. But at what expense? What are you ignoring because you have SIBO blinders on? What are you oblivious to like sleep and stress and vitamins and minerals and fiber and other things that I, I could go on and on. But like, what are you ignoring or what are you slacking off on because of those SIBO blinders? And is that the thing that's actually holding you back and not the SIBO itself? So that's my first answer. But let's pivot because I know some of you are deeply curious about what I meant in the beginning of the video when I said that this might be dependent on the type of SIBO you have. So let me draw a little bit of a visual. And this, uh, I have this in a couple of other videos so you can find it elsewhere. But 
We'll just do a real sloppy version here. Let me refresh your memory on something that I call the SIBO spectrum. The idea here is that there is a small subgroup of people who have way bad SIBO, like the worst of the worst. These are probably people with short bowel syndrome or have had like abdominal surgery where they've had part of their intestines removed, you know, something like that. And these are what I would deem to be real or old, old school SIBO. This is like the SIBO of yesteryear. These are the people who would have gotten diagnosed based on criteria in the day back in like the 80s or 90s or early 2000s. These are the real OG SIBO people. These are the people who have malabsorption, pernicious anemia, deficiencies, villous atrophy. Like these are the people with really bad SIBO. Then there's likely a middle ground where it's kind of new school SIBO, but I guess I will, I will label this, um, how do I want to label it? I will call this likely SIBO. So the overgrowth is to a point where it is probably clinically relevant and it's, it's somewhere shy of this old diagnostic criteria, but it's still above our current diagnostic criteria. And you're in that limbo where you probably really do have SIBO. It's just not as bad as these people. Then there's a zone that is actually much wider than the other two. And probably most of you are in this zone. This is the zone of you were told that you have SIBO, but you actually do not because our current methodology for testing for SIBO sucks very much. I'm going to call this one actually, no, you were told that you have SIBO, but in actuality you do not. Or I should phrase it this way. The degree of overgrowth that you have is not clinically relevant and it's not actually causing your symptoms nearly as much as you think it is. Then last but not least, we have this zone of people, people who were never diagnosed. They've never been told they have SIBO. Maybe they tested for it and tested negative and they, they're probably not even watching this video, right? Cause they don't think they have SIBO and that's okay. Cause they don't have SIBO. So anyway, when I talk about the types of SIBO, this is so much more relevant to me than talking about hydrogen or methane or hydrogen sulfide. Yes. Like you can target antimicrobials a bit differently in each of those circumstances, but the science on that is not as rock solid as we'd like to believe it is. And I have a big problem with how we're doing the testing. So I frankly don't run it anymore. But if you think about it through this way, if we look at the SIBO spectrum, right? Again, these people, they're not watching this video. So we're going to just skip that section. But if you look at these three, somebody with short bowel syndrome, or they've had a part of their bowel removed surgically, these old school, old severe SIBO cases, Again, probably they're not watching this video for one, but in some world where you have this version of SIBO, this is the one version where I think it's reasonable to do repeated antimicrobials and repeated antibiotics because there's something anatomically different about you more than likely that is causing the SIBO to come back and shy of growing a new longer small bowel, I just don't see how we're gonna circumvent that. So these are the people who might need ongoing treatment for the rest of their life. And that's perfectly understandable given the nature of what they're dealing with. There are these folks who probably have a clinically relevant version of SIBO. Again, it's not to the point of villous atrophy and malabsorption and all of this stuff, but they're certainly more SIBO-y than these people or these people. These are the folks where I would say it's reasonable to do two or perhaps three rounds of antimicrobials. But again, if you need more than that, that is a huge red flag and you really need to get your act together and pivot and do something else. Again, definition of insanity, moon tiara action, whatever you want to conceptualize this with, maybe two or three would be reasonable for this group. Beyond that, I, I just, I think that you're probably missing something really big. So let's see, two to three X. I'm going to say for this group, four plus. And then what about these people? What about the people who tested positive for SIBO or they were told by a well-intentioned but ill-informed practitioner that they have SIBO when they actually do not? What about these people? Well, 
you might get some mileage out of antimicrobials, believe it or not, right? Like the thing is, herbs do a lot of stuff and antibiotics do a lot of stuff. They're not just antimicrobial. Maybe you took Rifaximin and felt better, not because of its antimicrobial action, but because it helps heal leaky gut. Maybe you took Rifaximin and felt better, not because of its antimicrobial action, but because of its anti-inflammatory action, right? And similarly, maybe you felt great taking ADP oregano, not because you were killing candida or killing SIBO, but maybe it was helping your immune system or helping with your viral load or helping with candida in the colon, not the small bowel, right? Like there's a lot of different reasons why an herb can work for you or a medication can work for you. We just tend to get laser focused on the one mechanism of action that we're most familiar with. So you could maybe do a round here or there, or maybe your bigger thing is dysbiosis and you could treat the dysbiosis by clearing away the bad guys. Like maybe that's still a little bit of the conversation, but this, this section here, which I think the bulk of you are probably in, I would say maybe one to two rounds. So this is gonna to equate to one or two months of herbal antimicrobials, or maybe like two or three weeks of prescription antimicrobials, depending on how long the round is. And then you should be done. Again, if you're finding that you need more than this amount, that's a huge red flag that you're missing something tremendous. And maybe, just maybe, the overgrowth is not as clinically relevant as you've been led to believe that it is. I know, I know. Some people are gonna watch this video and they're gonna think I'm a big mean meanie pie. And you know what? I don't care. I would rather tell you the truth of the matter based on where the current evidence stands and my clinical experience and my clinical expertise. And I would rather tell you the truth and help you actually feel better than continue to coddle you and tell you that you just have the world's specialist case of SIBO. You're just so special. You have such a tough case and you need some magical herb that you've never heard about. And you have to dig to the recesses of the internet to find that one herb that's gonna work for you like magic, or you just need to be on antimicrobials and this sucky restrictive diet for the rest of your life because SIBO is a condition that relapses all the time. We could do so much better, so much better. This doesn't have to be hard to treat. And honestly, I'm at a point where here I am the SIBO expert and I'm in a position to say, I don't treat SIBO anymore. I, I'm just, that's not my job. I teach people how to build a SIBO proof body instead. And what's really cool about that is A, when we build a SIBO proof body and that's the foundation of what we're doing, it doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum, right? Having a SIBO proof body is gonna work for all of these people because a SIBO proof body is not only SIBO proof, it's candida proof, dysbiosis proof, brain fog proof, leaky gut proof, diarrhea proof, you insert name of symptom, and it's probably gonna proof you against that too. But there's a big difference between building yourself a SIBO proof body and trying to eradicate and kill and starve SIBO. And I see so many people stuck in this mode and they have the blinders on, they've, they've got this, and they've Googled every herb, every medication, every microbe known to man, and yet they don't see clear as day that their sleep sucks, or that their stress and their mental health is frying their vagus nerve, or that they have clear symptoms of low stomach acid, or that their relationship with food sucks, or that they have not eaten a molecule of vitamin or mineral in years because of their restrictive diet. So please, this is my plea, my, my, I'm begging you, please take off the blinders and actually look at yourself and your situation holistically and start working toward building yourself a SIBO proof body. And I think that it won't really matter how many rounds of antimicrobials you theoretically would benefit from. Because if you do that, I can almost guarantee you that you won't need antimicrobials at all. And of course, this probably goes without saying, but if you want to learn how to build a SIBO proof body, if you want to cut through all the bullshit on the internet, figure out how to reintroduce the foods you love, become SIBO proof, candida proof, leaky gut proof, whatever, come join FODMAP Freedom. We're gonna be enrolling again in less than two weeks. So we open up again on August 19th. This is our last group for the year until 2025. And I get freaking amazing results with people. 
I think partially because I tell it like it is and I really base my recommendations on research and current science, but also because we support you every step of the way. So if you have a question or a setback or a, a reaction that you didn't expect, or if something's going great or if something's going horribly, you can either email us or attend one of the 48 plus live Q and A's every single week and you can get the help you need and you can finally weed through this nightmare of a situation and just feel better, feel like a normal human being and eat like a normal human being again. So if any of that resonates with you and you want to build a SIBO proof body, I really hope that you'll consider joining FODMAP Freedom this August. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.